Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fandom Sports Media Corporation's live corporate update webinar. This is David Vidala from RBMG. Fandom is listed on the CSE under the symbol FDM and on the OTCQB under the symbol FDMSF. Joining us today is the company's CEO and president, David Vinokurov, who will be going through Fandom's July investor presentation. This will include an overview of current operations, recent achievements, and upcoming milestones. At the end of the presentation, we will open it up for questions for management to address. If you are interested in asking a question and are logged into the Zoom app or web platform, you can submit your questions to us directly in the Q&A question module. Please note, this presentation is being recorded today, Wednesday, July 28th, and will soon be made available on the company's website. Today's call may contain forward-looking statements that are subject to risks and uncertainties that may cause actual results, performance, or developments to differ materially from those contained in the statements and are not guarantees of future performance of the company. No assurance can be given that any of the events anticipated by the forward-looking statements will occur or, if they do occur, what benefits the company will obtain from them. Also, some risks and uncertainties may be out of the control of the company. Phantom Sports Media Corporation has a full disclaimer on page two of their presentation. Lastly, RBMG is not a registered investment advisor or broker dealer. For more information, please visit rbmilestone.com. And now I'll hand it off to you, David. David, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, everyone at RBMG for helping me organize this today. And thank you, everybody, for joining us as well. Uh, um, my name is David Vinokurov. I'm the CEO of Fandom Sports Media, and I will be going through our presentation and providing you some updates on uh, recent events and uh, some outlook on what we have going forward. As David mentioned, uh, there are forward-looking statements in the presentation. I won't go over them. Uh, I will be going over those statements, uh, but I won't go over this uh, disclaimer in further detail than David did, but uh, we will be discussing future things that may or may not occur. Uh, you know, what the mission of Fandom Sports is, it's to revolutionize the way that streamed content data is presented to fans, whether it's esports fans, sports fans, through hyper gamification and purpose built custom deployments to help them interact with that in real time or near real time, depending on whether it's for wagering or for uh, all ages fan predictions. Uh, our business is based on predictions and wagers and driving uh, revenues uh, from engagement with those predictions. Uh, commissions uh, earned on the wagers. We currently have a Curacao gaming license. And we, frankly, we just announced today that we're applying for uh, B2C and B2B Malta gaming licenses, which is a higher tiered license. Uh, our technology is based on machine learning uh, web platforms, uh, operates on a mobile environment on iOS and Android devices. Um, with the platform that we have, we have an exclusive use license for it, our unified information access platform uh, for sports and esports. Uh, this is an intelligent backend that has been deployed successfully in the healthcare sector, insurance, telecom, uh, supply chain logistics. Uh, in terms of the revenue streams that the company is going after, advertising, brand sponsorships, sports and esports league partnerships, uh, white label platform integrations, um, both on the all ages side and on the wagering side and obviously wagering commissions and wagering earnings. Uh, we are publicly traded as of uh, July 1st, you know, had a market cap of about 22 and a half million Canadian dollars. All figures that I'll be talking about will be Canadian. Um, we trade in Canada under symbol FDM on the CSE, OTCQB FDMSF, and for our European friends in Frankfurt uh, on TQ43. Uh, in terms of the ownership of the company, uh, I joined the company, the company was already public about 14 months ago, it was public for several years before that. Uh, so our management and our key shareholders, uh, we control about 15% of the float, uh, which has about 81 million shares outstanding. I'll get through to that a little bit later in the presentation. You know, my background is in capital markets, uh, business development sales. Um, Stan Yuzhemsky and Christian Gravel, our CTO and CSO, uh, are very successful tech entrepreneurs who have built uh, the platform uh, that powers uh, fandom sports core technology, uh, which has been deployed in the sectors that I talked about. Uh, so it's a tried and proven system. Uh, the rest of our team is, is fantastic, both across the gaming and the wagering sectors. Uh, Philip Chen, our chairman of the board, has extensive experience uh, 
extensive background in private equity, mainly in Eastern Asia. Uh, Tristan Brett has spent 11 years with Electronic Arts and various other game developers. Andra Inescu, our nearest, uh, newest director, uh, a corporate lawyer, uh, seasoned entrepreneur, brings a lot of uh, good corporate governance to our board. Uh, Scott Keeney, uh, DJ Skis, the founder of uh, Dash Radio, as one of the premier influencers for all things collectible in North America. And he's got extensive contacts with, with many professional sports teams and players. Uh, our advisory board, again, is composed of a, of a wide spectrum of, of industry experts. Uh, John Armstrong runs the largest esports working group in LinkedIn, 50, 60,000 connections. Uh, Guy Bendov is the head of the Israeli Gaming Association uh, with extensive network in Silicon Valley. Uh, Neil Duffy and Wim Stocks were previously at World Gaming, which was owned by Cineplex Odeon, then sold to a U.S. private equity group. They've moved on to uh, other successful roles in the esports sector. Um, Mr. Yunhua Fai, who's our esports advisor in China, uh, is the CEO of a company called GameFi, uh, which is owned by the Shanghai Pro Media Group, uh, which broadcasts League of Legends in China uh, on television. Uh, so we're, we're leveraging a lot of his contacts for our uh, deployment in Asia. I'll get to that a little further in the presentation as well. Uh, Rick Padulo is in Marketing Hall of Legends, numerous award-winning uh, marketing campaigns across North America, and most importantly, for you know, the sake of our conversation here, and all the marketing for Poker Stars in North America. Again, this is just some of the experiences with, with the organizations that uh, our advisory team has and our management team. You know, uh, just to give you a brief overview on what esports are and why competitive video gaming, you know, um, four or five years ago, but a lot of people might have scratched their heads as to, you know, people actually get played, paid to play video games. Uh, I think now that it, it's just a given that uh, you have you know, dozens of teams across 20 plus titles that are getting paid professional grade salaries with coaches, with facilities, with infrastructure, uh, teams, leagues, et cetera. You know, my prediction is that, you know, the line between esports and sports will become blurred. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll just see that convergence as we've seen with stream content in the past, moving to mobile devices and so forth. You know, so, you know, where does fandom fit into esports wagering? I think we're we're very unique in our value proposition in that we cover both sides of that uh, of of the full sectors. Uh, you know, iGaming it's a very competitive uh, historical industry. Um, you know, the projections for this industry just went right through the roof as soon as COVID started. Hopefully, it's going to be over. But uh, and as we've seen. Um, you know, restrictions decrease and increase, unfortunately, in certain parts of the world. You know, we've seen a steady continuation of the trends that we saw that emerged uh, when, when, when COVID became prevalent last year. Um, you know, on the, what we are able to offer on the iGaming side is peer-to-peer -peer wagering, head-to-head -head wagering. Uh, we, our goal is, again, to be a business service provider. And of course, we already have signed affiliate partnerships. You know, some of the logos that you see on the right side are some of our competitors uh, in or comparable, sorry, in the sector. On the fan engagement side, um, you know, when we get a little into further into the demographics uh, of esports and gaming as a whole, you know, we'll realize that the majority of the demographics are under 18 years of age. Uh, so we feel that the larger opportunity is, is going to be as an aggregator of an all ages experience, providing our predictive capabilities. Um, first in a business to consumer level, then as a business to business provider, and ultimately as an enterprise plugin uh, for some of the top streaming services. Uh, Twitch uh, is the predominant North American uh, streaming platform, you know, billions of hours created every quarter. Uh, Discord and TeamSpeak are, are, are variations of, of communication tool, right? You know, what we saw with Discord, you know, some of you may uh, use some Discord channels for investment advice or just uh, you know, due diligence or <laughs> something fun to read sometimes. But uh, it started as an agnostic chat platform so that people could communicate while they're watching their favorite streamer who may be streaming on one or more uh, platforms at the same time as they try to grow their audience. Uh, I believe they turned down a offer from Microsoft for about $12.5 billion, maybe about 60 days ago. They have 100 million plus users. And it's just an agnostic chat platform that started um, as a way for the gaming community to speak with each other. You know, our goal is to follow that model, uh, become an agnostic prediction engine across streaming platforms, 
And then, you know, as that audience grows and matures, and if they're in a jurisdiction where it's legal, you know, we can lift the proverbial velvet rope, invite them into our iGaming environment and provide a fan engagement experience right from the time someone becomes a gaming or a sports fan to the time that, you know, they are of age and they are able to wager all built on our own technology, on our own platform, on our own infrastructure. Um, you know, the demographics of why esports, you know, what we see uh, is, is just booming audiences, right? You know, everyone likes to see a chart that starts at the bottom left, moves to the right. You know, uh, the viewership numbers for esports for the League of Legends finals, uh, the last one was 137 million people that we have the statistics on, which is more than the Super Bowl. Uh, so so the, the, the scale and scope of the audience is certainly there. Um, Esports betting specifically itself has been growing at 44% year over year, you know, even before um, COVID came into play. Um, we still see that continuing to grow. In fact, esports wagering um, it, it is the more uh, accretive revenue generator than the esports teams themselves. Um, I think that'll obviously change in the next five to 10 years as the teams build out, as they build out their infrastructure. And, you know, uh, we, have, we see teams building purpose-built stadiums. Uh, they just announced that they're going to build one in Toronto for 15,000 fans at a $500 million cost to facilitate the local esports teams. So what we're building, one we can service either in arena fans or as people watch at home. Uh, the overall gaming market, I think this is real, the real opportunity is, as I mentioned before, you know, what an eight-year-old was playing Valorant uh, two years ago, sorry, Fortnite two years ago. You know, as a 10 year old, they're playing Valorant. As a 14 year old, they'll be playing a different game. Um, so their lifetime value to a specific game will change and mature throughout uh, the time that they are an esports fan. So the overall gaming market, this is the real opportunity that we are able to go after because of the, the capabilities that our technology provides us. So that's $180 billion a year, and, and that continues to grow. You know, we see new developments. Uh, with streaming plat with gaming streaming platforms, Netflix just announced that they're getting into game streaming as well. Uh, you know, all, all, all the top uh, Facebooks, Googles, they're working on platforms as well. You know, we're agnostic to that. We're able to uh, get our own data feeds to the top titles that have open data feeds. We're able to plug in uh, to the tournament hosts who provide their data feeds. So we're completely agnostic as to where the content comes from. And again, as I mentioned, our mission is to really fandomize the world and change the way that people interact with that data in real time or at near real time. Now, how our system works, how does our UIA platform work? Basically, we can ingest data, 22 different hundred types of data, uh, and through proprietary neural networks, event listening technologies and vector analysis, we're able to create um, actionable alarms that trigger certain things. So we have a data feed to a tournament. Uh, we get you know, the entire stream of data. Our system recognizes that data as it comes in. It triggers a prediction that can shoot across the screen that people can interact on, reconcile that prediction, whether it happened or not, then trigger a series of events, uh, leaderboards, points, uh, social notifications, and so forth, and then present that in modular ways right, whether it's in our uh, web-based platform, whether that's in an iOS app, whether that's in an Android app, whether that's an enterprise deployment uh, to a specific streaming platform. Um, it's all funneled through our backend, and then we can customize the way that that interacts depending on what the partner requires from us. Now, the system uh, that we've licensed from uh, Christian and Stan's company, Data Bionics, this is a system that they've built uh, over the past uh, seven, eight years that they've deployed successfully uh, with Sodexo, which is the largest facilities management company in the world, uh, WellCare, it's a healthcare provider uh, here in Ontario, the government of Ontario, Ellis Dawn, um, it's an institutional construction firm in Canada here. They use the system to power uh, smart hospitals. The government of Singapore uses the system to manage their healthcare records. Basically, what it does in a healthcare setting, um, you know, you have disparate systems that operate HVAC alarms, uh, neonatal alarms, ICU alarms, door alarms, fire alarms, robots that deliver medication up and down hallways. All of these different types of hardware uh, have to communicate to a centralized command system or to a more specific nursing station on a specific floor that has specific use cases. So the UIA platform is able to present that data 
in a specific way for the specific application at hand. So, you know, when it comes to evaluating data uh, for predictions or more for wagers, which again is a much more highly regulated environment, uh, you know, this system has been proven to be effective in mission critical uh, settings where, where literally lives are on the line. So uh, in terms of the compliance and the security protocols that we operate on, you know, they're well in excess of any type of PCI compliance that we would need to safeguard data, credit card information, and so forth, uh, because it's, it, it was really built uh, predominantly to serve the healthcare industry. So everything that we're talking about, you know, I, I would say it's a, a large undertaking for, you know, what's relatively a startup to say, we're going to do all this, but we're very fortunate that we have uh, our partners at Data Bionics that have given us this exclusive use license. It's the first time in any industry that they've allowed uh, an exclusive use license. So uh, we're very proud of that. We're looking very much forward to uh, getting some traction in the industries we're going after. Uh, you know, what I'm showing you here is some of the user interfaces that we're building out for the all ages capabilities. You know, what you can see here is you can log in with a variety of social platforms. Um, you pick your games, you pick your streams, you pick your teams. And what you'll see is on screen number five here is that as you're swiping left or right, you know, there, there's no user interface that um, lends itself to any type of wagering platform. There's nothing really that you see that say, hey, this is a betting platform, right? But, but through changing the user interface, as you can see, if you log on to fandomesports.gg, you know, you see that it's very wagering focused where you're actually putting in dollar amounts, you're making deposits and so forth. So this really demonstrates the, the unique capabilities of what we can do. Um, you know, what you see uh, as a static image is actually a stream. These are open source streams for esports. Uh, for sports, it's slightly different because, you know, that content is much more fenced off in terms of broadcast rights. Um, you know, we're working on several things on that. Uh, but basically, you can watch a full screen stream experience, swipe left, swipe right, challenge your friends. You know, our platform supports 14 different languages. Uh, your, uh, you can share your predictions or even wagers across uh, 11 different social platforms. Uh, we just announced that about 45 days ago. Uh, so we are able to really foster a community of gaming fans, of sports fans, share your predictions. And again, if you are of age and in a jurisdiction where wagering is legal, you know, instead of playing for points, you're playing for money. Um, that all ties into our global leaderboard status and then our NFT reward strategy, which I'll talk about a little bit later in, in the presentation as well. Frankly, here it is. So what we're building right now is an NFT marketplace. So right now, um, NFTs are created uh, based on Ethereum uh, protocols. So, you know, there's gas fees, which are, is the cost to generate the NFT. Uh, that is a very dependable, uh, sorry, a variable cost. I mean, can be hundreds of dollars specifically. You know, when you're uh, minting you know, one of Beeple's artworks, for example, that sold for $69 million, um, you know, if you pay a thousand bucks to uh, mint that NFT, that's really not a barrier to entry. The barrier to entry comes where, you know, you have selectivized uh, protocols that pick the NFTs that are being created based on what the cost would be. So it really creates a scalable issue. You know, what our goal is, is to, create NFTs on the fly with sale on provisions that allow revenue sharing for the content creators and the organizations behind them. And uh, as you're watching a stream, you know, hit a button, create that NFT. If there's more than one person, uh, hopefully there'll be you know, hundreds of thousands of people that only create that NFT at that moment uh, to store in their moments wallet. Uh, you can mint that NFT on the fly, trade it in our marketplace. Uh, if, if more than one person wants to create that NFT, it goes to auction. There's a revenue share capability with the leagues, the teams, the players, et cetera. It creates revenue opportunities for us, creates digital rewards and incentives for our community. And as we see with the trends of NFTs, um, you know, people are collecting digital moments, right? You can have your photo album of all of your favorite moments that you've had in life, photos, vacations, et cetera. And then, you know, a separate digital wallet uh, of digital memories of, you know, your favorite headshots, kills, uh, touchdowns, goals, grand slam home runs, you name it. Uh, our system, uh, which we're building out, will have these capabilities. Uh, we'll have much more news on that in detail as to some of the protocols that we're working on. Uh, but again, the goal is to make a seamless way to watch content, play, predict, get rewarded. The rewards, you know, 
uh, leaderboard status, merchandise, experiences, travel, and uh, NFTs for the digital memories and so forth. Uh, the marketplace that we're building out is completely agnostic. So whether you buy or build or purchase NFTs on any other marketplace, it will be tradable on ours and vice versa. Open Ocean IO, I think, raised $100 million at a $1.5 billion valuation a while ago. And, uh, you know, it's all built on open source software. Whereas, again, everything that we have is built by us in-house on our own infrastructure uh, that are all one-of-one -one systems. So we're uh, really excited to get that out. Um, you know, here I have some of our uh, competitors, uh, comparables in terms of features. You know, again, uh, this is similar to the chart that we had before where we show that we're really at the intersection of fan engagement and iGaming. Again, whether you're making a prediction as you know, a social event or you're actually wagering fiat currency, cryptocurrency, what have you, uh, you know, the features and capabilities that we have um, on both sides of that equation, uh, none of our comparables have that capability today. And again, if you look at our valuation, uh, on uh, the comparables, again, you see that, uh, you know, I believe there's some significant upside in investing in fandom today, uh, once we're able to execute on these new initiatives. Um, hopefully, we're going to drive some value for our shareholders and stakeholders. Um, in terms of our milestones, where, what are we doing to, to, to justify that valuation? Um, you know, we're looking to launch our wagering platform now in terms of what is live on the platform now. Uh, we have um, our own APIs to League of Legends, Dota 2, CSGO. We added uh, data streams on uh, 11 additional game titles, including Valorant and other popular titles. Uh, we've added odds line wagering. So our peer-to-peer -peer marketplace is, is only effective, frankly, when someone else either accepts a prediction or accepts a wager from you. In the absence of that, you know, uh, we're able, we want to offer odds line wagers so that you can come on our platform, watch the streams, make your wagers. And, you know, if you're successful, uh, obviously we'll, there'll be payouts or, you know, fandom sports will act as the house. Um, you know, technically we still are in Q2. Our, our Q1 for us starts in February. Uh, that being said, um, the only thing that's preventing the system from being fully live as it is, is our payment integrations. Um, you know, that's something that we've discussed for some time. Um, what's happened is, is that Malta changed uh, where our offshore banking is located, some AML guidelines back in May. So it's just taken a little bit extra time to uh, pass the due diligence and compliance checks as there were some new procedures. Um, so I'm just waiting on some notifications from our bankers that their bank account set up and then we'll move ahead with our payment processors. Um, this is not a question of if, it's just simply a question of when. And as I've been reassured by her, three legal teams that are working on this matter, it's any day now, which has been going on for six, seven weeks. So uh, once we get past that, uh, we want to launch our esports, or sorry, our all ages uh, esports fan engagement in the back half of this year. Uh, we've been on time, on budget for every single uh, initiative that you see listed on this list. I expect that trend to continue. Uh, we will be, so let me just take, skip a slide ahead here. So what's our strategy really to go to market, right? You know, uh, the team at RBMG put it to me very clearly and that really resonated. You know, we have to crawl, walk, and then run. So in terms of crawling, you know, it's launching our business to consumer site, which again is uh, just missing the payment gateways uh, to be live. Once we do that, we can present the use case scenarios to our business to business partners. And then depending on the modular capabilities that they're looking for, uh, we can custom tailor that solution plug it into their platforms. All the while, what we want to be doing is collecting data on the overall user experience. Because our ultimate goal is to be an agnostic prediction engine to all streaming platforms. Um, but again, we're building out that community organically through our own business to com uh, consumer platform, through our business to business plat uh, partners. So you know we have a three-pronged approach to gaining a user base. Now, we already have established partnerships uh, on the business to consumer side, on sorry, on the business to business side, and uh, some leads on the enterprise uh, deployments. Uh, we have affiliate programs in place uh, with Gamer Wager, which is based in the UK. It's a head to head wagering platform where, you know, the difference between peer to peer and head to head is uh, wagering is very simple. Uh, peer to peer, I wager you that something will happen in a third party event. Head to head wagering is I play you at Call of Duty, for example. I beat you, I take your money, 
and the revenue model is really quite transparent. Um, you know, you either pay a monthly subscription fee of five pounds, or there's a five to ten percent commission uh, on the actual wager amount if you don't sign up for a monthly subscription. That is the same revenue model that we're going to be pursuing with our peer-to-peer -peer marketplace. So we have an affiliate uh, arrangement with uh, Gamer Wager. You know, they have a established user base of tens of thousands of users. Um, still a private company, so I can't disclose the exact numbers. And you know we'll we'll be marketing our services to their users. We'll be marketing their services to our users uh, because we also have another affiliate partner. Uh, it's a fantasy sports platform again with tens of thousands of users. Uh, Elite Duels, um, you know they've been generating revenue for three years now, so they've been doing a fantastic job. And what we're doing is is we, uh, we're going to be fostering that community between all three of us. Now, as those users interact on our platform and watch streams and make predictions and uh, generate predictions, we're able to aggregate uh, data analysis on that use case. So um, we have an LOI uh, with a company called Funjoy Limited. Now, Funjoy is the subsidiary of a company called Nextjoy, which is the private sector partner uh, for GameFi, uh, whom uh, our advisor is the CEO of. It's, it's a little challenging in China uh, to um, partner with state-owned entities. So we're working with private entities that are affiliated with those parties. Um, Andrew Wang, who's the CEO of Funjoy, uh, he's head of the Asian Esports Federation. Uh, so he's responsible for setting up uh, collegiate esports leagues uh, in all the countries uh, where China's building out its Silk Road initiative. You know, just in China alone, I think they have over 100,000 colleges that are playing all the titles that we have in our games. And ultimately, all esports, you know, the largest, most popular esports lead back to China anyway, through Tencent, uh, through NetEase, Obviously, in North America, we have EA Sports and so forth and Blizzard. So um, our goal is to collect the data from the partners that we have, leverage the communities that they have built, do some test marketing to them, get the data we need, and then make the case for the enterprise integrations. Again, because there's nobody that can do what we can do in terms of in-game data and presenting that data. The difference that we talked about before uh, when I said in real time or near real time uh, for esports specifically, uh, all wagering takes place pre-match because obviously uh, there's so many events that occur per minute. So uh, to prevent um, any issues when it comes to wagering and, and reconciling an event, you know that has to lag. When it comes to predictions, we can present this in near real time because you know there's no payouts, right? We don't have to audit. You know, th there's no specific hard dollar cost whether predictions correct or not. You're, you're given points, you're given tickets, uh, you're given chances to make in-game purchases. So um, it, it's not inherent that that is presented in real time. So we're able to tailor, again, tailor make the solution to whether it's an all ages fan experience or whether it's a regulated iGaming experience. Uh, one other uh, marketing partnership that which we have is with a former, again, former director of ours, uh, who is the principal of Yala Esports. Uh, Yala is based in Dubai. They have nine professional teams. They have 32 players from 27 countries uh, with, from the Middle East and North Africa, uh, highest, highly engaged social media, highly engaged in esports. So and again, we're going to be doing the test marketing to them as well. Uh, we have a pipeline of other uh, partners that uh, we're in discussions with to broaden uh, the base in which we'll be doing all of our test marketing campaigns. Um, once we get our payments set up, uh, we're going to do our uh, business to business integrations uh, with Gamer Wager with Elite Duels at first, and then grow from there one step at a time, aggregate the data, present that to our friends in, uh, at Funjoy, and then make the case for the enterprise integration. So, so we have our strategy laid out, we have partners in place, we have more partners in the sidelines who are waiting to do things. Um, you know, in terms of the announcement we made today, uh, we're applying for a multi-gaming license, which is considered a tier one gaming license around the world. Uh, we have the Curacao license, which allows us to accept wagers um, everywhere but Spain, France, Australia, and some Dutch colonies. The Malta license gra grants us specific access to accept wagers within the EU and to market uh, our B2B services within the EU. Um, the next step for us in terms of gaining access to new jurisdictions uh, Canada just recently passed the legalization of single event wagering. So basically that's opened up the domestic market, which is valued about $14 billion a year of online wagering, of wagering, sorry. Uh, 
So uh, we're proud to say that we're a member of the Canadian Gaming Association. Uh, Ontario uh, is taking the lead within Canada, which is the largest market within Canada. And so by the end of the year, uh, the market will be open uh, for regulated uh, wagering. And, you know, we're going to be very excited to take a part of that. We are in discussions uh, with other groups as well on the business to business side uh, that have existing licenses in various states in the US and, and other jurisdictions around the world. Um, so again, we're very excited to demonstrate the capabilities of it, do our initial business to business launches, and again, make the case uh, and, and uh, present that to the other partners that uh, we have for allowing us to be a technology provider to the entire industry. Um, so again, you know, just in summation, you know, we are a private com a public company, sorry, <laughs> even though we've spoken with lots of uh, venture capital investors, but, uh, you know, we trade on multiple markets, uh, CSE, the OTCQB, you know, uh, we have plans to upgrade our U.S. listings uh, as we make more uh, execution on our business plans, uh, 81 million, 82 million shares outstanding, 120 million fully uh, diluted. Uh, we completed a financing uh, first week of April, three months ago, uh, for about five point one million dollars. Uh, we're, you know, we have a very strong cash cash position relative to our uh, burn rate. Um, so we, you know, have several years of runway. Uh, that's we're not going to rest on our laurels, mind you. Uh, so the financing that we did was at twenty four cents. We raised five point one million dollars. We have a full warrant. Uh, outstanding, uh, which is at 36 cents, and that expires in about 16 months. So, a fantastic group of investors, uh, you know, that are standing by us as we execute on our milestones. Uh, we're excited to report our results back to the investment community, to our shareholders, to yourselves, and uh, we have a lot of exciting go-to-market events and milestones happening over the fall. I'm looking forward to our next uh, webinar where I can update you on those, and I'm happy to open the floor to questions at this time. Thank you, David. Um, <clears throat> if you're interested in asking a question and are logged onto the Zoom app or web platform, you can submit your question to us directly in the Q&A module at, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll take a moment now to develop that queue and then we will begin Q&A. All right, well, let's begin. Uh, David, um, how are you obtaining people to play on the app? How are you getting new uh, users? Well, um, as I mentioned, we have partners that have established user bases already on an affiliate level. Excuse me. So uh, it's, it's a standard affiliate program that you see in online gaming, you know, any uh, it's about 70 30 split. So any users that come to our platform, our, our partners get 30% of the revenue and vice versa. So we're gonna be marketing to those existing user bases with incentives uh, to come to our platform, to engage in our peer-to-peer -peer wagering market, uh, to engage in our odds line wagering, and then a, a percentage of uh, the net gaming revenue will go back to our partners. Uh, we have uh, our marketing partners, Yala Esports, they have millions and millions of fans across all of, all of their uh, teams and the influencers that are on their teams. So we're going to be doing some test campaigns on social media to attract users to them. And then again, the strategy is then to aggregate that data, present that to you know, some platforms that we've been in discussion with and uh, do enterprise deployments to their existing user bases. You know, um, one of the challenging things, specifically in online gaming, is that you know, the, the user... You know, the, the ultimate formula that we're looking at is customer acquisition cost versus lifetime value. You know, um, you have, you know, the DraftKings and, and the other incumbents, Penn Gaming, uh, William Hill, Bet365, you know, that are offering hundreds of dollars to entice people to their platform. So you have extremely high user acquisition costs relative to what you see, would find on just social media platforms. So, you know, we, we want to engage with the platforms that have the existing user bases, embed our technology there, and do revenue shares on any in-game purchases uh, to open NFT packs um, and so forth and create a game really within the game. So uh, just to reiterate that we have partners that have user bases that are going to be marketing our services to their user bases 
And then once they become a user on our platform, we'll be cross-marketing all of these different complementary services uh, to drive revenue. So uh, we're excited to do that. You know, what's preventing us from doing that at the moment uh, is, is the payments integrations. Uh, but that's, again, any day now that we've been waiting for that. I know I've said that before, but uh, basically <laughs> we're dealing with multiple compliance departments and different continents and, and a highly regulated industry as well. So that's why we're really excited about the all ages opportunity. Uh, it's um, a high barrier to entry in terms of what we can do. So we're really not too concerned on you know, any competitors coming in behind us because they just simply can't do what we can do. Uh, but it's just a little bit easier to operate in, in that less regulated environment. Sure, good answer. Um... With regard to the Malta license, uh, what kind of what kind of time frame are we looking at before that is approved and in place? Yeah, so these uh, the process can take anywhere from six to twelve months, depending on how fast you move. Um, you know, given the fact that I've been working on a Malta banking license and keeping everything compliant uh, with our Curacao licenses, we have all this information at hand. So it's not a, you know we have experience in, in applying for this license. So uh, six to twelve months. Uh, you know, once we get closer to that six months, I can tell you a little bit more accurately whether it'll be seven or eight or 11 or 12, but I'm confident we can get it done on, on, on the shorter side. Okay. Um, with regard to cash on hand and the burn rate, you said you did the raise back in April, but how do you stand currently? You kind of touched on it, but I think people are looking for it. Yeah, so, so we, just before Christmas as well, we raised close to $800,000. In April, we raised 5.1. Um, so we're in and around the $5 million mark. So if, if you consider we spend maybe about a million or so in, in the first six months of the year, uh, you know, we just finished our Q1 financials, which came out about 30 days or so ago. So th that's a fair reflection of where we stand. So uh, we, we've got uh, a very clear and defined technical roadmap. Um, and uh, like I said, we've got some cornerstone investors that came in through our last round that you know, are happy to support us in the meantime. And uh, you know, like I said, my background's in capital markets, so we know where to go if and when we need more money. But ultimately, again, that's gonna be uh, predicated on us delivering on the milestones, which I'm very confident on. Okay. Um... Can you comment on any potential rollouts that Fandom might have for the remainder of 2021? Absolutely, yeah. So we're looking to build out the team, uh, compliance, finance, marketing, business development. Um, we're going to be elaborating uh, in much more detail what our NFT protocols and strategy will be. Uh, we're going to start our um, marketing programs. We're going to start our business to business programs. Uh, and we're going to have our all ages platform ready at the end of the year, beginning of next. And our goal is to aggregate data as we roll out these marketing and business to business programs to start making our enterprise deployment case uh, in you know the first half of next year. Okay. Um, it looks like we're going to take one more question. Sure. Um, with regard to fandom stock price, um, how come you don't think it's taken off with so much great news that's been coming out? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, you know, I really can't comment on where the stock price has been. I think uh, junior markets have been a little bit uh, weak over the summer. You know, I know that there was a, a, a sharp rise in all things esports at the beginning of the year. I think our performance uh, relative to that spike to some of our comparables has been better, frankly. Um, you know, the only things that I can control are us executing on the deliverables, demonstrating the value, making the case why you know, what we've done can generate this type of return and so forth, and just to execute on what our plan is. Unfortunately, the market will do what it will. And um, yeah, we just have to work keep our nose down, keep pushing. So, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in that small steps lead to big breakthroughs and just focus on, you know, our clearly defined plan. And as that occurs, you know, obviously with the help of our friends at RBMG that help us organize these events, keep our shareholders informed, be transparent with what we're working on and just uh, keep the lines of communication open, um, attracting new investors, engaging with existing investors, right? That, that's what I can do personally, so continue to do that. 
That's a great answer. Fair enough. All right. Um, thank you, David, and thank you everyone for joining today's webinar. Today's webinar will, will, webinar recording will soon be made available on Fandom's website. If you have any additional questions that have not been addressed on this webinar, please feel free to email us at fandom at rbmilestone.com. Again, that's fandom at rbmilestone.com. And thank you again. You are now free to disconnect. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Appreciate all your time. Thank you, guys.